All right, so in general, we know that the form of, of a precipitation reaction is just going to be um, two aqueous ionic solutions added together. And when you do that, if you make the right combination of ions, when they get mixed together, you make a solid. What happens to the rest of the ions? If we mix barium chloride and potassium nitrate together and we get barium chloride, they're still just floating around in the solution as ions, right? So what is the other product then in this case? K plus and NO3. Since we have them all written as ionic compounds, we could write them, we could write it out as potassium nitrate. And we'll talk about in, we'll talk about this uh, today, um, but yeah, when when we have ionic compounds, we really have the ions floating around. Sorry, ionic compounds dissolved in water. We really have the separate ions floating around. We've talked about that a little bit, right? So they're just still there. They're what we call spectator ions. They're not doing anything. They're really only there to balance out the charge because you can't add chloride and barium without having something to balance out the charge. Are we balanced? Now, what do we need to do? We're making barium chloride, which has two chlorides, right? So we need at least two chlorides, which means we need two potassiums, which means we're going to make at least two here. And that should take care of it, right? So now that we have it written out, what we can do is take is take the rest of the word problem says 25 mils of 1.2 molar KCl is added to 15 mils of 0 0.900 molar. So let's write it out the way we usually do these problems, 25.0 ml, write out information we're given, including concentrations. And 15.0 mills at 0 0.900 molar. We want it, and in a case like this, if it says calculate the theoretical yield, it doesn't specify of what, how do we know what we're talking about? How would we actually be able to measure a yield for this reaction, practically speaking? Yeah, we're not going to measure the yield of the aqueous component. We'll measure the yield of the solid because the solid's going to form solid. We'll be able to collect it and we could weigh it and get a mass for it. All right, so now, now this is rewritten in the form that we're used to dealing with these problems, right? Even if we've been struggling with them, if we're not comfortable with them yet, at least it looks a little bit more familiar. This is the way I always write these stoichiometry problems, right? How do we know what the limiting reactant is going to be? Or first things first, what's the first thing we always do on a stoichiometry problem like this? Balance it and then put everything in moles. And then we'll be able to figure out what the limiting reactant is. So how do we, if we're, if we got a volume and concentration, how do we get to moles? Well, what is moles, what is molarity mean? So if we know how many liters we have, we can use that as a conversion, right? We know it's a thousand milliliters is one liter. And we know that one liter of this solution is 1.20 moles. All looks familiar, right? Uh, so we'll get what a quarter point zero zero three. Is that right? 
who's got a calculator out? Is this right? Okay, cool. I, I'm, you know, I'm just doing mental arithmetic, so I appreciate the confirmation. It's not really a rhetorical question when I ask, did I do that right? Um, how many sig figs do we keep? Three. Three sig figs here. Let me double check. Yeah, in, in our concentration had three sig figs. This has infinite sig figs, right? That's an exact conversion. So we'll keep three sig figs. Oh, and I messed up the abbreviation. Point zero three zero zero moles of potassium chloride. We do the same process here. We get point zero one three or point zero four five. Keep the color coding the same. No, zero zero four five. One three five. There we go. Right. Divide by a thousand times point nine. Yeah. My mental arithmetic is working today. I must have had just enough caffeine. So what's gonna run out first? And why? There's less of it, but we're not using them up at the same rate, are we? We're using this one up twice as fast. So on the excess reactant question, this was something that I noticed a lot of people struggled with is you got here and then you just said there's less of this, therefore it runs out first. But we're not using them up at the same rate. In this case, you're right, Mia, this one does run out first because we have less, because we have more than double of the one that's being used up faster. But the way we show our work for that, say, okay, take the one that you think is the excess reactant or the one that's the limiting reactant. And we're just going to see how much we're just doing theoretical yield here, right? It doesn't say excess reactant. Um, we don't really care how much the excess reactant is left over. And so this is the way most of you did this for the limiting reactant part. Use each of these to figure out how much product you can make, and whichever one is the smallest number, that's got to be the right theoretical yield, right? If you have enough hamburger patties to make 18 hamburgers and you have enough buns to make 25 hamburgers, how many hamburgers can you make? 18. All right, so that's conceptually what we're going to do here. For every one mole barium nitrate is one mole of product. If we do the same thing with the other one, we'll get 0 0.0300 moles of KCL. And this is the trick, right? Don't forget that for every two moles KCL, we only make one mole of product. So we have enough barium nitrate to make 0 0.0135 moles of product, but we only have enough, and we have enough KCL to make 0 0.015 moles of product. So if we'd use this approach to see the limiting reactant, which we're not done here, 
this is another common mistake is a lot of people, not a lot of people, several people got here on the test and just left it. Does that answer the question? You calculated two different theoretical yields, which one's right? You still have to say which one is the correct theoretical yield if you showed it this way. So even something as simple as just boxing it is enough, but if you give me two theoretical yields, you've got to tell me which one's the right one. Um, and you're not going to add them together. That's a less common one, but logically it doesn't make any sense, right? Go back to the hamburgers and, and, and buns. We have enough hamburgers to make 18 hamburgers, enough patties to make 18 hamburgers, and enough buns to make 25. We're not going to add those two numbers to get our total number of hamburgers, right? Whichever one's the smaller one is the right theoretical yield. And since everybody struggled with the excess reactant part, I'm going to tack that on here. If we wanted to figure out how much excess reactant was left over, we just have to figure out how much is used and then how, versus how much we started with, right? So in this case, we're, we've shown at this point, this is the limiting reactant. So if we use up all of our limiting reactants, barium nitrate, For every one mole of barium nitrate, that's two moles of KCL used. Which 130, 135 and 135 is 270, right? So now this is where we're going to look, we're going to combine them because we can say, well, if we have 0 0.0300 and using up all of our barium nitrate would be 0 0.0270 moles used, then we can just do the subtraction. My beating this to death is this really boring at this point or is this look totally foreign and is it was it just testing stress that everybody forgot how to do this in the in the when you hit number seven i should probably restructure it so that you get to that one earlier because when you get to number seven it's probably also when about when you realize that you're running out of time so i get that i just wanted to make sure that we i wasn't leaving you in the dark as to how to answer that question Plus, it's good to keep our skills up for stoichiometry problems because we're going to be doing all of these reactions so that we're, we're working on all these reaction types don't have as much in the way of calculation questions. So this is just good to keep us sharp. All right, so what was our theoretical? Our theoretical yield was 0.135 moles. What is that in grams of barium chloride? Pull out your safety blanket, your periodic table. Let's do molecular weight. Let's see, barium's pretty far down. There's that 170, so we're going to be something like 340. There's that 137. Okay, so something right around uh, 200. What's our is 20 something? So we'll get something pretty close to pretty close to three grams for a theoretical yield in grams. Two point one. Thank you. 
All right. while I'm thinking about it, more good test taking strategy. If you know, if you get to a problem on the test, you know it's going to be a time sink. You Maybe you don't quite remember how to do it all that well, and you're going to have to work your way through units or just it's one of those problems that takes a lot of math on a, on a page. That's not a bad idea to leave that one till the end. Make sure that you don't leave easy points on the table because you ran out of time before you got to number nine. But you knew how to get, you knew how to do number nine, but you just didn't get have any time left. You don't want to leave easy points on the board, right? So make sure that you answer all the questions you can quickly and then start spending time on the ones where you're hazy on the details or just take a lot of work. Um, and also, reminder that in this class especially this this class is pretty gentle about the way i give you the practice test it's the exact same format right so if you know or you think that you're going to have some time pressure on it get good at doing those questions quickly right you know the types that are coming right don't be surprised you shouldn't be surprised you already had the practice test as a homework assignment get good at doing them quickly or at least knowing where the quick parts are right, so that you can maximize the points you get. Again, things things that were somewhat self-evident to me when I was when I was growing up and learning how to take tests or not everybody thinks the same way I do, it seems. Um, so learning how to take tests is a learned skill. It's not, people are not just good at taking tests. Some people brains already think in terms of maximizing points for the amount of effort or time. If your brain doesn't naturally go that way, start thinking that way. Get good at that and you can get good at taking tests. What's the percent yield if we get, I just erased the number, was it 2.89? Sorry, 8.1? That's our theoretical yield. If we actually collect 2.45 grams, what's our percent yield? So when that was one that wasn't on the test, right? Percent yield on your equation sheet as actual over theoretical. We don't really care about if it's a positive or a minus because we don't care which direction it is off, just how far off it is. Um, I guess that's more for percent error. In this case, actual over theoretical times 100. So our actual is the amount that you're given, 2.45 grams over 2.81 grams expected times 100. So get something in the 80% range. All right. How do we feel about that one? So reaction studies are okay as long as you have enough time in your periodic table, right? All right, good. Then I'll also open it up like I, I was talking about beginning class. I have not posted a key for the energy questions. So I'll open this up for a second too. Does anybody have any questions about last week's homework that you want to go through? While you're thinking about that, I'll pull up the assignment so I can throw up on the screen here. 
All right. Anything in particular we should go over? There's at least one, right? Um, four C. Yes. Four B and four C. Yeah. Okay. So this does not specify. If what got if you, what you got hung up on was just the um, we don't have a mass for the soda, then you're all, if I don't give you a number that you need to do a problem, you can always look up a number and just write, I assume the mass was this. It's never a bad idea to keep track of any assumptions that we're gonna that are baked into this. Um, what other assumption is there in part C? We had water condensing on the outside of the can. Part C had you calculating how much the soda warmed up. In addition, it says if all energy came from the soda and the soda has the same heat capacity as water, are there any other assumptions built into this problem? Nothing? Is there anything else changing temperature that we're not calculating any of? If you have a can of soda, you really have two things, right? You have soda and you have the can, right? Does this problem ask you anything about the can's specific heat? Is the can going to perfectly transfer all the energy straight through it? No, the can is going to absorb some energy too, right? So that's another example of sometimes... Sometimes the problems have assumptions built into them or, and it's never a bad idea to be thinking about, well, where does this calculation fall apart? What am I doing that is an assumption? You don't always have to write them down, but it's never a bad idea to have stuff like that in the back of your head. Well, this problem's not quite right because we are ignoring the fact that the soda can has a mass as well. So from B, We have 6.512 grams of water condensed on the outside. How much energy was transferred? So we've got a delta H of condensation given, or vaporization is the same thing, right? It is 2.26 kilojoules per gram of water condensed, right? So if we have 6.512 grams of water, Every time one gram of water condenses, it gives off 2.26 kilojoules. The language might also be um, throwing you off too. That's more or less a typo. The energy doesn't come from the soda, it goes into the soda, right? That's just me being sloppy when I typed that problem and I hadn't caught it yet. So, but that's gonna give us grams, cancel grams, we get a number in kilojoules. What's the number we get? 14.7 kilojoules. And that's gonna be energy that's released by the water that's condensing. And that's the energy that's gonna be absorbed by the soda, right? So since part B it still says, it just says how much energy was transferred. You could just write transferred. Transferred is one of those words where I'm all, it always looks like it's spelled wrong to me because it all, feels like it shouldn't have two R's, but then it does, I think, anyway. Um, so if all of that energy went into the soda and the can has the same heat capacity as water, it's a reasonable assumption. What's the final temperature of the soda? We have to assume a few things here, right? We need a mass for the soda and we need an initial for the soda. Let's just find the temperature change. 14.7 kilojoules is our energy transferred. We're plugging this into Q equals M CP delta T. Mass, we're gonna look, look up 
you can look at if you have a can of soda in front of you, you can just look at that and use that. I have happen to know the can of soda is 335 milliliters, roughly. Uh, maybe that was before shrinkflation. Um, but in general, you could, if you even just want to make the math easier, just assume 350 milliliters or assume 350 grams, since it's going to be close to the same density as water. You just need to pick a number that's reasonable for your mass. So let's say we're going to say that our mass of the soda, let's just call it 350 mil, uh, grams. If we're assuming specific heat of the soda is the same as water, we know CP. Joules per gram degrees Celsius. And we know Q, but we want it in joules, not kilojoules, right? So 14.7 times 10 to the three joules equals 350 grams times 4.184 joules gram degree Celsius delta T. What do we get for delta T? That's going to be about, you get five for delta T. Three hundred and fifty times four is pretty close to fourteen point seven. Would that be a factor of ten? I think you get twenty, or sorry, forty. So it's, delta T should be ten ish. Little bit and for sig figs, really this was our biggest source of error, right? Because we just kind of made up a number. So if we're realistic about that, this is probably only two sig figs. Right? If we actually went, if you went to the trouble of going and looking up mass of a can of Coca-Cola and more sig figs than than that you'd be able to keep more sig figs. Putting more effort into getting better numbers means you get to keep more digits when you round, which makes sense because there should be less uncertainty the more time you spend on it, right? So we'll just call it 10 degrees Celsius. Does that sound like a reasonable number? What is that in terms of Fahrenheit? Every 1.8 eight degrees Fahrenheit is one degree Celsius. So Fahrenheit delta T is going to be close to 20 degrees Fahrenheit difference. Does that seem reasonable? Has anybody ever um, taken a cold can out of a cooler in the summer in the Midwest? It warms up really, really quickly because of the humidity, that condensation that um, turns out this is a reasonable number. In the space of about 10 minutes, your ice cold beverage will go from 33 Fahrenheit to about 72 Fahrenheit in under 10 minutes, um, which we don't have that issue here as long as you set it down in the shade, right? Our sunlight is more intense, but we don't have the humidity causing that. So if you've ever wondered why people in the Midwest always have a koozie on the outside of a can, it's not actually because it, to keep the, the drink from getting warm from your hand, it's actually to prevent condensation on the outside of the can because the condensation warms things up way faster than your hand does. And that's why it's become sort of a Midwest stereotype that they always have a beer koozie on their can. It serves a really useful purpose. All right, any other questions about the homework here? 
we worked, we walked through how to do number five, but we didn't do the specifics on it. That's the one where you had to set them equal and then solve for TF, right? So that one had some nasty algebra to it, but reminder, you can always use a solver. Just write it down. If you set your problem up properly and then write for your next math step when you're showing your work, I used a solver. That's a valid math step for this class, but you do have to tell me how you did the algebra, whether it's by hand or by using solver. All right, anything else anybody wants to ask about the energy stuff? We'll get some more practice with that soon enough. All right. Let's talk a little bit about solubility. Why is it that some ions, when you mix them together in their aqueous state, turn into a solid and some don't? Basically, why do precipitation reactions happen? That's where we're going with this. Um, so this is starting from the very basic. Um, so, like we mentioned before, when we dissolve ionic compounds in water, they're not really going to stay as ionic compounds. When you dissolve sodium chloride in water, sometimes we write it as NaCl aqueous, but what we actually have is the separate ions floating around. Right? And really, we make this assumption for any ionic compound dissolved in water, we're going to assume for the most part, it splits up entirely into its constituent pieces. So really what we get is sodium ions floating around plus chloride ions floating around. Well, why would they split up like that? doesn't really make a whole lot of sense for them because you still have a positive charge and a negative charge and positives and negatives should do what? Tracked, right? So why is it that when we dissolve an ionic compound in water, they don't stick together? What else is it? Could I do the same thing if I just took sodium chloride solid? Is there, can anybody think of a way that you could separate the pieces? And with a, a little bit more experience, you, you, I mean, you kind of can, but not really. It turns out if you're talking about a, in this case specifically, if you wanted to try and turn this back into its constituent atoms, if you wanted to make sodium uh, metal and chlorine gas, you have to heat it up till point till it's liquid. You have to melt it and then apply a pretty significant voltage to it. And then you can get it to go through electrolysis and split up back into sodium metal and chlorine gas. Um, it's really, really not easy to do. It takes a ton of energy. So what is it about this situation that allows them to be split up? Water's polar, and polar means what? It means that it's got a partial positive and a partial negative, right? So if you have a plus charge floating around surrounded by water, water can actually sort of arrange itself so that all of these oxygens where the partial positive is, or where the partial negative is sort of or, um, arranged around the sodium ion. So we're making some favorable interactions. When we take these ionic compounds and dissolve them in water, we basically are replacing the attraction between the, the sodium and the chloride with these attractions between the water molecules and the sodium ions and the water molecules and the chloride ions. This is one of the reasons why polarity is such a big deal in a solvent. It's because if you have a solvent that does that is nonpolar, it can't do this. And most ionic compounds won't dissolve in a nonpolar solvent because you lack these favorable interactions. What about the chloride? What's the chloride doing while all this is happening? <laughs> 
yeah, anything that's got a partial positive also has or partial negative also has a partial positive, right? So chloride is going to be set up pretty much the same exact way. And it turns out to be more or less an octahedral shape. If you notice the way I drew all these, it's kind of an octahedral geometry. They don't form true covalent bonds, but you have these really strong attractive forces that are almost as strong as a covalent bond. And we do see the same thing happen with the chlorides. So we're just replacing one type of favorable interaction with another type of favorable interaction. And under, under normal circumstances, these reactions, this the system that we have here is gonna be slightly more stable than allowing it to stay as a solid, but not by a lot, which is why there comes a point where you can't just keep dissolving salt in water forever, right? What happens if you just keep adding salt to water? It stops dissolving. Although even that's technically not true, it still dissolves. But it, what happens is if you have enough of these ions floating around, there's a significant chance that they bump into each other, right? And if a plus charge and a minus charge bump into each other, they're gonna tend to stick, right? They're gonna stick even better than having these all around it. Cause these are all you know, favorable interactions, but not that strong. If we can get these two to stick back together, that's an even stronger bond. So if you add enough sodium and chloride into the solution, that starts happening. Basically, you reach a point where the, the what we call the dissolution reaction and the precipitation reaction are happening at the same rate. And if the forward reaction and the backward reaction are happening at the same rate and we can't see individual atoms, it looks like it stopped dissolving. But you can think of it a little bit like, like looking at, at population of a state. If California has 1 million people leave and also 1 million people come to California, what's the change in population? Zero, right? Is that actually true at the person-to-person -person level? No, people are still coming and going. We call that a dynamic equilibrium. I mean, a dynamic equilibrium means stuff's still going on, but there's no net change. So money is another good example. If you have if you have a job and you get paid a thousand dollars a month and you also spend a thousand dollars a month, if you only look at it at the first of every month, it looks like nothing's happening. But really, you've got a whole bunch of things happening, just putting as much in as you're taking out at the same time. All right, so how does this apply to solubility? Well, it turns out that every combination of ions has its own saturation point, has its own point where you can't dissolve or where the forward reaction and the backward reaction wind up canceling each other out. But because every different ionic compound has a different binding energy, has a different amount of energy that holds them together, the, diff the amount that you can dissolve before it, I'm gonna start saying it stops dissolving because that's the faster way of saying it. Um, as long as we all keep all this in mind, it's not really stopping the process. There's just no net change. But every ionic compound has its own saturation point where it stops dissolving. In some cases that, that saturation point is really, really low concentration. If we did something like change from sodium chloride to magnesium sulfate, then we get something like this. What do you think the attractive force looks like between magnesium two plus and sulfate two minus? So you can be more or less than sodium chloride. And why? 
Because what? Farther from zero? Yeah, the, the attractive force between charges is based on how big those charges are. If you double each of these charges, it turns out the attractive force actually went up by two times two. You doubled both of the attractive forces. And I'm gonna, I might butcher this equation because um, I'm going from memory, but it's basically, was it Z1 times Z2 times Faraday's constant maybe over R squared, where R is the distance. Z is two charges. That's a constant that's measured, and that's the distance between the two charges. If you double this one and double that one, your, the force of attraction just went up by a factor of four, not a factor of two. Right? So in other words, don't worry about that. We're not going to do any math with that. This isn't a physics class. Um, but we would expect the attractive force to be four times as strong here. If the attractive force is four times as strong, it means it's a lot harder to get it to dissolve in water. And it also means you reach that equilibrium point a lot faster, at a lot lower concentration. So what does this matter for precipitation reactions? It means that basically we kind of have to have just a table. And I'm going a little bit out of order here. So we'll jump back in a second. Um, you have something that looks like this. This is this is a more detailed version than usually what you get. Usually you get a table of solubility rules, right? This is and we talked, you guys have seen that table before. You guys did solubility rules and precipitation reactions before. This is actually a more useful way of looking at it because you basically have something from the vertical column or from the vertical axis and something from the horizontal axis. And you just look at them and you get a number. So sodium and sulfate, SOL for soluble. That means it doesn't give you a number, but it means it dissolves pretty well in water. And if you get a, a combination that's not soluble, then it's that red. And then there's some of them in here. This is what, what those regular solubility rules leave out. Some of them are slightly soluble. Calcium sulfate is slightly soluble. That doesn't really make it really easy to tell what to do, though, when it's predict this precipitation reaction. So usually we have a more simplified version that we give you as the solubility rules that just say yes or no. Logan? How do we put a number to that, right? That's the trick. Um, and so really, the, the best tables are actually they actually just have a solubility as a concentration where they say, what is the, the solubility, the maximum solubility um, or the saturation point? So for instance, here's an example. The solubility of sucrose in water is 2000 grams per liter. That's a lot more than just saying it's soluble. Um, and so in that case, that, that allows a lot more detail. And then we can actually get even more detailed um, because it basically it turns out that your this reverse reaction, the likelihood that two of these run into each other and stick together is based on those concentrations of each of them, right? And those concentrations don't have to be the same. If you try to dissolve sodium chloride into a solution that already has a whole bunch of chloride from something else, that's going to affect how often this is going to happen, right? And so we actually, the most accurate way of doing this is what something called the solubility product, which we'll spend more time on when we get to talking about equilibrium in more detail. The solubility product just says that Whatever your concentrations, if you're if you're at equilibrium, if you're at that saturation point, your concentration of each of these two multiplied together is going to be equal to a certain constant, which you can look up. So there's tables. Most most uh, all those chemistry textbooks in the back will have an appendix at the back that'll just be filled with KSP values for all these different ionic compounds. 
And so that's that's the most accurate way to look at it. And the solubility of the soup based on that water. It turns out that that only makes a difference if your tap water already has some of the ions in it. So our tap water ha doesn't have a whole lot in it. It already has some magnesium in it though, for instance. So that means that our tap water is not going to have the same solubility for magnesium sulfate as DI water. But yeah, you're right. In general, if you look up a table, it means in DI water. But if unless your D our, uh, tap water has sucrose in it, then it's not going to affect the solubility of sucrose. All right, so a couple more vocab terms. Those are the big concepts that we're talking about today. Um, we'll do some practice with the solubility rules and simplified version for starters. Um, but let me... Um, the idea that when you dissolve ionic compound in water, you get these ions. When you have ions dissolved in water, that's, that's actually what an electrolyte is. So who's heard the term electrolytes in somewhere, right? Where have you heard the term most? Sports drinks. It's actually been co-opted as a marketing tool more than it anything. It's, until today, did you know what an electrolyte was? Or just that you're, what, it's got what plants crave. Um, so if, if you haven't watched the movie Idiocracy, they talk a lot about Brondo is the version of Gatorade. But basically it's like, well, nobody knows what electrolytes are. It's just, they're just there. It's good for you. Drink your Gatorade. Um, but an electrolyte really means that you have something charged dissolved in water. That's what makes an electrolyte. If you have DI water, deionized water with no electrolytes in it, um, it actually won't conduct electricity. Electri electricity passing through water relies on having um, ions present, so that when you move current, when you move electrons through that material the charges can kind of stay relatively balanced. You've got electrons moving one way, you're gonna drag some of these positive charges with the electrons and some of the chlorides move the opposite way to avoid those electrons. Um, it also winds, it turns out that's exactly how our body uses nerve signals to communicate is based on concentrations of sodium ions and potassium ions in your bloodstream or not in your bloodstream, in your nervous system. Um, I mean, I haven't taken anatomy and I'm blanking on the name, but what's the space, the interdendrite space or something like that, the space in between the nerve cells? Synapses, thank you. Um, the synapses are going to have certain concentrations of sodium ions and potassium ions. And the, those cells taking those, those ions in or releasing other ions is how your nerves, nervous system works. Um, which is also why it's really, really dangerous to throw off those concentrations. Um, has anybody ever seen a video of somebody finishing an Ironman triathlon that just sort of like starts staggering and they can't, can't even walk anymore? It's not really because their muscles stop working. They develop what's called ataxia, um, which is basically your brainstem stops being able to communicate with your muscles, which means you can't actually tell your muscles what to do anymore and you get really dizzy and you basically, your legs just stop working. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that Gatorade was developed was to try and make sure that you had the right ratio of electrolytes, but it's just become trying to sell Gatorade. Um, so don't just drink Gatorade in place of water because it is bad for you in large amounts, unless you're actually losing those ions, those electrolytes through sweat. Um, you really don't need the kind of level of electrolytes that are in sports drinks. I shouldn't just harp on Gatorade, but when I grew up, Gatorade was the only sports drink available. So that's the one that I associated with, like Band-Aids. Um, uh, it's also, there's also an issue back in the 90s when that when um, sorority and fraternity hazing was still really, really big. Um, there was a big push at uh, Chico State 
to cut down on the amount of forced drinking that pledges were for, were being asked to do uh, if they wanted to join a particular fraternity. And so they started doing the same challenges, but with water instead. And they wound up with people dying. Not as many as died from alcohol poisoning before that, but you can actually die from overhydration because if you continue that same logic, if your brain stem stops being able to communicate with your muscles, that also includes your heart and your lungs. And so a lot of your sympathetic nervous system, is that sympathetic? Yeah, the sympathetic nervous system functions stop working if you get overhydrated. Um, turns out not, uh, we're going to skip that for now. We'll talk about that in more detail when we get to equilibrium. All right. So that point, just to use the vote, right vocab term, that point where you can't get any more net change when you add more ionic compound or any solid really is called saturated solution. So you can, a saturated solution just means that you can't get any more of a particular solute to dissolve. Um, and a solution that's saturated in one compound is not necessarily saturated in all compounds. So you could have a solution that's saturated in say lead chloride, but it would still dissolve plenty more sodium chloride, right? Those relative solubilities and the fact that you can change, you can independently change these two mean that you can have a whole bunch of different situations where you're kind of mixing and matching ions. Um, and this is just a uh, slide that looks at one way you can measure um, how many electrolytes are dissolved in a solution is basically you can look at how well it conducts electricity. They actually make these devices for specifically for teaching chemistry classes, um, where it's basically just an open, so you plug it in, you can plug it into the wall, and then it's got two leads that you dip into a solution. And if that solution will conduct electricity, then you can pass current from the negative to the positive here and, and wind up completing the circuit and light turns on. And that light will be if you do it in a totally covalent compound with no ions present, that light won't turn on. Basically just stays dim. You do it in some in a strong electrolyte, which is an ionic compound that, that associates 100% in water, you get a really bright light. Then you can also have a weak electrolyte, which is basically when some of your ions split up into pieces, but not all of them. And in that case, you get a dim light. Um, really the better way to do it, this is a good visual way to look at it with the light bulbs, but you can actually measure conductivity of a solution and put numbers to it as well. Um, I don't think this one's worth spending it too much time on because this is basically just solubil or um, concentration units. Basically always your solubility and your saturation points are always going to be communicated in terms of um, concentration units, right? So it's basically just a specific use of concentration units. When I teach, when I taught this class last at the college, um, somebody asked, "What's the difference between molarity and solubility?" Well, solubility is the molarity at a very specific case when you've reached that saturation point. So it's a little bit like asking, what's the difference between speed and the speed limit on a road? Well, the speed limit on a road is a speed. It's a maximum that you're supposed to go, right? The solubility or the saturation point is a concentration. It's just the concentration that's the maximum that you can reach for that particular compound in that, in that solution. All right, so, and I actually have, there's a pretty cool video of um, a precipitation reaction. Hey everyone, today's video is for- That is, um, it's actually a kind of a famous one because this was actually used by the ancient alchemists as a way to prove to, you know, kings and rulers that they were making progress on their way to on turning lead into gold um, because this is actually a lead-based compound. 
you take lead nitrate um, and I think it's iodide, I think it's lead iodide, um, and you mix them together, you wind up with starting with two totally colorless solutions. But when you mix them together, you get this sort of gold yellow um, solid form. It doesn't look like a solid because it's um, it's still just floating around. And then it'll actually redissolve a little bit when he does this, but add a little bit more and you start seeing he dumps the whole thing in. Basically the whole solution mix two colorless solutions together and you get this, this really cool yellow, vibrant yellow color, which then when you filter it out and, and let it dry, it actually looks a lot like metallic gold leaf. Um, so this was more of a like, they didn't really know what they were doing, but the alchemists were able to continue to get, to get funding by showing, well, we're getting closer. Look, this kind of looks like gold, um, even though it wasn't actually what was happening. And you get these basically a ton of these really, really small crystals when you do this initially. And you form these really, really quickly. Um, then when you swirl it, you get these cool patterns that happen. Looks a little bit like a gas giant. Um, but then what happens is when you change the temperature, you actually change the saturation point. You can actually get more solids to dissolve in the same amount of solvent if you increase the temperature. So that's the next thing he does here. And the reason it's worth looking at. So he gets all the way back to, that's the same yellow solution that he was just doing. Gets it completely clear again, just by adding heat. And then when it cools back down, they start to form these crystals again, but forming the crystals more slowly allows them to turn more crystalline. And you get these bigger chunks that look um, even more metallic. which is kind of cool. And then turns out when you're making a crystallization, when you're, a precipitation reaction is a crystallization. You're making these, these ionic compounds and giving them a chance to form really, really slowly. Um, but if you do it really fast, you get tons of really, really small pieces. But just the same way that like different salt, you can have really, really fine salt versus salt that's in big crystals, right? The only thing that's different about that is if you slow down the crystallization process, they tend to find form these bigger chunks instead of making really tiny, small crystals. Um, and then when he, if you swirl it up and then filter it, you get that that gold color, and then you, he actually takes it a step further and puts it in a sample vial that looks a lot like gold leaf. Um, so again, this wouldn't have been actual gold, and they didn't even think it was actual gold back then, but alchemists may have tried to pass this off as a way to continue to stay in the king's good graces. Look at this cool stuff I can do, and it looks almost like gold. Um, I mean, this is really one of the reasons why that's why it's such a uh, there, there. Um, such a common reaction setting, why we understand it so well, is it's one of the first reactions that was commonly that was commonly used before they even were called chemists. All right. So here's an example of, of the simplified solubility rules. And right. I showed you the more complicated one that had all the possibilities. But this doesn't transfer, this takes up a lot more space, right? And even this still doesn't have enough information to really be that useful in terms of a number for any of these. Like what the heck does slightly soluble mean? Well, how are we supposed to know just from this? What would be more useful is if this was full of solubilities in terms of numbers, right? So if you had 
you know, a whole bunch of molarities up here as the, um, instead of just soluble, insoluble, slightly soluble. So with that in mind, we usually use these more abbreviated, oversimplified versions for the for asking questions about this because it just yeah. takes up less space for the for the type of questions we're going to ask. So, in this case, what happens if we wind up mixing things together and we don't make something that sticks together? If we mix those two solutions together and nothing happens, do we still? Is it still a reaction? I mean, not really. If we took, if we don't make a combination that's insoluble, that forms a solid, then really we just, now we just have a big mixture of ions floating around, right? So if we started with potassium, is it potassium chloride? Potassium chloride and potassium ions and chloride ions floating around and then we mix them with sodium ions and nitrate ions. Once we mix them together, they're all in the same container now, right? Do we make a combination that is insoluble, that's gonna form a solid with these compounds? What are the possible ionic compounds we could make? Well, sodium nitrate and potassium chloride, those are the ones we started with, right? What's the only other possible combination that we could make here? Would be, well, if, what about sodium chloride and potassium nitrate? Basically, all you do is you switch the anions and you see if you make anything that's insoluble. So down here at the solubility rules, you have basically have two categories, soluble or insoluble. And so soluble has says basically, okay, group one, column one on the periodic table is soluble with everything. With one exception, lithium phosphate doesn't dissolve well. Any other compound that in involves column one on the periodic table will be soluble, period. Which takes care of our question right here, just by reading that first solubility rule, right? Potassium and sodium are both in column one. Neither of them are lithium phosphate. So are we gonna make anything that dissolve that uh, turns into a solid? No, because potassium nitrate is not going to form a solid. Sodium chloride is not going to form a solid. So if we mix two solutions together, we don't make something that according to our solubility rules is insoluble. We just still just have all this stuff floating around. So in which case we just say no reaction. So that's always what we're looking for with these precipitation reactions. If we want to know what's going to happen, if it's going to do anything at all, we just check our solubility rules and we see if we make something insoluble. If it's insoluble, that means it turns into a solid. It won't stay dissolved. So how about sodium chloride and lead, lead one acetate? Is that going to stay dissolved? So lead one acetate is soluble. What's our other combination? We could have sodium acetate. Acetates are soluble. And sodium compounds are soluble. So sodium acetate is not going to form a solid. What's the other possible combination? Mercury and chloride, right? So we check in down here, we look for either chlorides or mercury. Chlorides, soluble, except these four exceptions. Lead, um, silver ions, lead two ions, copper one ions, mercury one ions. So that tells us we will in fact have a reaction happening. So what is the, what are the products going to look like for the second example there? 
NaCl aqueous plus Hg2C2H3O2 to sodium acetate still aqueous. And so here's our solid product we would actually form. This one is kind of an exception. Mercury one ions don't exist as singular ions. They exist as a dimer where you actually have two, two mercury ones stuck together. You can't get mercury one by itself. And so that's why the formula looks weird. Normally we would just write it as HGCl. It turns out that's not how it actually behaves. So, but that's really the only ion, the only that I'm aware of that does that mercury one ion specifically. Mercury two ion behaves exactly as you would expect it to. Mercury one though does this weirdness. Um, that's not something that would necessarily show up on a test per se. I'm not gonna test you on exceptions like that. All right, one more before we run out of time. Ammonium sulfate and strontium chloride. What are our other two combinations? We could have ammonium chloride or strontium sulfate. Are either of those combinations insoluble? NH4 compound, soluble, no exceptions. That's not gonna be the ammonium chloride. Strontium is not on here anywhere, but chloride is chlorides, and it's not one of the exceptions. Oh, sorry, sulfates. We're looking at sulfates. Sulfates, soluble, except strontium-2 is on there. So strontium sulfate will form a solid, and the ammonium chloride will still be aqueous. And all right, you can have a minute to pack up. Leave that last one. We'll talk about acid base reactions and some other orbital stuff on Friday. So I'll be on Wednesday and I'll talk about last week. <laughs> Thank you.